If you know me personally, you're almost certainly aware that I'm a huge Ape Escape fan. I'll take just about any chance I can get to talk about it. Man, I heard you failed that test. That sucks, dude. You know what'll help? Playing some Ape Escape, the best game around. Shoot, I even had my old scratched up CD hanging up on my wall. Honestly, it was only a matter of time before I made this video. I mean, our channel name is inspired by it. You see, this is probably one of the first games I ever played. Uh, my dad had these PS1 classics he liked to play and he let us play them sometimes. There was the first Tomb Raider, Pong Next Generation, Asteroids, and of course, Ape Escape. I remember them all fondly. I mean, I even played all the Tomb Raider games semi-recently in order because I had a strong desire to visit the old times. But none of those games quite captured me like Ape Escape. I think what drew and kid me was all the bright colors and interesting color palettes because what kid doesn't like bright colors? And as I got older and played the other games, I started to appreciate more than just the pretty colors. And that's what this video is about, talking about all the aspects of the series that make it truly amazing. Now you might be thinking, this just sounds like you have some extreme nostalgia. Is it even that good today? And while that's definitely a factor, I play 1, 2, and 3 almost every year as like a tradition and it's still as fun as the day I first play each of them. And now you might be wondering, okay, okay, but why make this video now? Well, I wanted to make this video after we had more subs on this channel because I wanted as many people to see it, but I'm pretty sure we're on the precipice of seeing my 10 plus year dream realized. There's been a lot of teasers popping up lately for Ape Escape to celebrate its 20th anniversary and I've been getting pretty hyped. There are a lot of things that can come from this, from a new mainline Ape Escape to a remastered trilogy game like what Spyro and Crash did, though they would probably have to take the great Metal Gear Solid out because of licensing problems, all the way to an Ape Escape Pachinko machine or a Pokemon Go ripoff. I'm hoping it's not the last two because I'm getting dangerously hyped here which will make my disappointment ring out across the world. So while I'm waiting for that pin to drop, I thought I'd channel my hype into something more constructive, like gushing about my favorite series. So let's get into it. Oh, but before I jump off the deep end, let me tell you now that I'm limiting the scope to Ape Escape 1, 2, and 3 because even though I do enjoy some of the spin-offs, that would make this video way too long and all over the place. Well, more so than this video will probably be. Eh, maybe I'll do a video about it later, but for now, it's time to play the intro. I don't want to drag this video out because I'm sure it's already going to be pretty long and I know you guys would hate me beating around the bush. So let's drag the proverbial monkey out of the bush and talk about the controls. Ape Escape was one of, if not the first game to incorporate dual analogs into the control schemes. Sure there were games that came out before Ape Escape that used the analog sticks, but in those cases it was just another d-pad, it functioned the same. Ape Escape was different though. You were required to use a controller that had analog sticks or else you wouldn't be able to play the game. And since it usually is the first thing people talk about when Ape Escape is mentioned, I'll just break down the control scheme real quick. D-pad controls the camera, you barely use it, with L1 resetting the camera so that it turns to whatever direction you're facing, which you'll be using a lot. L2 lets you switch to first person, but I tend to use that sparingly. R1 and R2 are both for jumping, but it's mostly up to you which one you prefer. I personally use R1 exclusively. The face buttons are where the gadgets you use are mapped to. You press one and you switch to that gadget with, select letting you quickly remap your gadgets. And now to the most important part of the controls. Left stick lets you move with L3 making your character crawl while the right stick lets you control your actions. Just about everything you interact with requires the right stick to function. It's like the original Monster Hunter but it actually makes sense. Where your right stick moves your gadget follows. There are other controls for the different situations you're in but that's the gist of it. It might be a little confusing when you first play, but hey, I was just a little baby and I figured it out more or less. And if you stick with it, you're treated to a 3D action platformer that has the fluidity of a well-made twin-stick shooter, if that makes sense. Movement is very responsive, uh, maybe a little weird in two, and switching between gadgets is instantaneous, and that's not even mentioning actually using the gadgets. Like I said mere seconds ago, the gadget follows your right stick, which seems simple but it really goes a long way as you never really worry about figuring out how a gadget works. And this carries on into using the transportation. For example, very early into Ape Escape 1, you get to use a paddle boat? Raft? And it works exactly as you would expect. Left stick controls the left paddle and right stick controls the right paddle. This is all to say that everything controls exactly as you would expect and makes sense logically. Which is perfect because you need to be in complete control of your character when you're chasing monkeys and battling occasional, occasional camera problems. 
All right, so for the next thing, I'm not gonna lie and say I'm basing this on something because I'm basing this on absolutely nothing, but I believe that Ape Escape was the next logical step for collectathons. You know, games like Banjo Kazooie, Mario 64, uh, Unbox. I can go on and on about this. Well, maybe not. But Matthew Matos has touched on this in one of his reviews, and he's way better at explaining this to me, but I'll try anyway. So part of the fun of collectathons are that you're traversing great levels in order to find the thing that you're trying to collect. Sometimes it's as easy as jumping a bit all the way to having to solve puzzles or accomplish something in order to, you know, collect the thing. Usually there's a sort of relief when you see the thing that you have to collect because you had to do potentially difficult things to find it. And now you just have to walk up to it and boom, easy money. What Ape Escape ends up doing is adding another layer to collecting what you need, mainly by making the thing collect it sentient. Hence the whole monkey, I mean ape part of Ape Escape. So now when you're primed to catch a monkey, you have to actually chase the monkey. And sometimes they fight back, which brings up another thing. There are different types of monkeys, which is super important because you have to figure out which type of monkey you're about to catch because it will change your approach. There are monkeys where you can just run up on them and others where it's way better to sneak up on them, lest they fire off on your kid body or just run away really fast. And of course, there's always the option to come back for those monkeys when you're better equipped. Oh, I almost forgot to mention that in Ape Escape 3, it's a very real possibility to lose your monkey net and get captured by a monkey, so there's that. It's a fun twist to the formula that keeps you on your toes, and uh, I think that's about it for that. So up until now, I mostly talked about the gameplay and the cool things about that, but I really need to talk about the levels themselves, because they are pretty damn important. So each game followed its own theme based on whatever the story was. Ape Escape 1 had levels that spanned throughout time, starting from the age of the dinosaurs all the way to the future? Present? Ape Escape 2 went international and had you traveling the world to such locations as a factory and floating temples? Ape Escape 3 had the monkeys hosting television channels, so the levels reflected that by honing in on popular movies, settings, and the whole concept of being in a TV show. Generally though, the levels are pretty impressive. A lot of them are novel and pretty unique, whether it be some of the cybertech space levels you go into or some weird kung fu parody town. A go-to example I use to show how creative the levels can be is the level in Ape Escape 1 where you go inside of a dinosaur for the whole level to catch monkeys. You have to climb up broken ships and fight sentient uvula while avoiding bacteria and it's as silly as it is great. To this day, I can remember that level from start to finish and that goes for many other levels. You can tell there was a lot of thought put into the levels so that they flow from area to area with the opportunity to backtrack if needed. There's never a sense of being completely lost as there's always a monkey close by, unless you're doing a 100% run, but hey, there's always the monkey radar to guide you. And there's also the places that you couldn't get to initially that rewarded you if you remember to go back to that part when you got certain gadgets. In the very first level of the whole series, there's a monkey you can't get to until you have the Sky Flyer, and it primes you to look out for this kind of thing throughout the game. That is, of course, if you're not doing the slingshot glitch, in which case you can really do whatever the hell you want. Not even the ceiling can hold you back in your quest to reach the heavens. Anyway, in addition to that, the games like to slip in random stuff that doesn't progress the game or anything, but are there as a fun little gag to further drive the setting of the level you're in. For example, you'll see monkey paintings based on popular pieces or wall scrolls that will slip monkeys into them. Plus, it's always fun to see how the monkeys have wreaked havoc on the level, whether it's taking Red Riding Hood's place to using a woolly mammoth as a pet so he could patrol the area. Each level is largely unique, so it never feels like you're going through a similar level again. And this is further accented by the amazing high energy music in the game. So now it's time to do something that we never do on this channel, talk about the music. To me, Ape Escape has one of the most memorable soundtracks of all time, and this is entirely due to the fact that SIEJ wanted to evoke a certain feeling with the game, and they accented that feeling with an unusual style of music for the medium, Jungle. which is like a style of breakbeat that's kind of like the predecessor to drum and bass. And one of the best examples of how this works in the series is in Ape Escape 1 when you first get to Crumbling Castle. Let's go! Throughout the game, you see how many monkeys you have to catch on your way to Spectre, and just the change to showing that catching Spectre is the objective of this level is already fantastic, but then you load into the level, you hear those drums, Spike says let's go, then you're hit with the bass, and now you know you're in for a grand showdown. 
SIEJ made the right choice going for an unorthodox yet high energy style for their faster paced collectathon. In fact, Soichi Tarada, the composer for Ape Escape 1 and 3, said, Spike was the type of kid who was always on the run. The running fit well with the 160 or 170 BPM of Jungle. The director agreed that the beat of Jungle and drum and bass really suited the pace of the game. That's the reason why when they changed the musical direction in 2, you instantly lose some of that vibe of Ape Escape and replace it with something that feels a lot more kitty. Just go compare the title theme of Ape Escape 1 to Ape Escape 2 and you'll instantly know what I'm talking about. I mean, you could even go look at 3 for a good example of the kid-like vibe with the Ape Escape flair. All I'm saying is that there's a reason I still listen to the soundtracks to 1 and 3 to this day. So while the music is memorable, so are the characters in play. There's a reason why the monkeys got their own TV show despite being a group of monkeys. The monkeys themselves are moldable. Their penchant for wreaking havoc as well as the helmets increasing their intelligence gives them the freedom to do and feel whatever they want. You have shade wearing machine gun toting monkeys, armor cladded monkeys and jetpacks, monkeys dressed up as Santa Claus, and really the list goes on. I'll never forget the first time I saw those monkeys that were married and living in an igloo together. They even had a family picture. It was funny to think about how they had a full life together before they got captured. The best part about the monkeys though is that you can use the monkey radar to scan any monkey in the game. They all have stats and a little fact about them though 3 shows the monkeys thoughts instead. It may be simple but it adds a little personality to the monkeys. They're not just items to be captured, they all have a little personality which makes capturing them a little sadder. I see the monkeys as way less annoying rabbits or minions if you really want to bring them up. And it's not just the regular monkeys that get all the fun. Starting from 2, the Freaky Monkey 5 comes in and they're pretty cool. My favorites are definitely Monkey Blue who's just love struck but he has a dope character design and Monkey Red who really likes fighting. And of course at the top of the monkey chain is Spectre who slowly went crazy as the series went on. It's hard not to feel bad for him because he did spend most of his life in captivity so I can see where he's coming from. It's just, you know, he probably did take it a little too far. I mean, rewriting history so that you could Planet of Apes the world? That's too much. And it may seem like an asshole but it's pretty funny how he ended up in 3 because he was so cocky in the first game. It's such a fall from grace. The humans might be a little less memorable but to me they are. Though that might just be because I've seen them for so long. Spike is the secondary face of the franchise in my opinion just for the amount of times he shows up. And at least he has the trait of being headstrong and willing to go through time to capture some monkeys which is actually kind of crazy. Jimmy from Ape Escape 2 is voiced by Ash and Natalie is voiced by Misty so if you squint hard enough you'll probably see a Pokemon episode. I'm pretty sure Pikachu is somewhere in the game. KN3 is whatever, I think he's fast and Yumi, well I don't want to talk about that. I will say I really like how she's already an established pop star and some of the monkeys will fanboy when they see her, aka easy pickings. At the end of the day, humor really drives home all the characters, whether it be through the dialogue they have with each other or through visual gags. Like I said, there is a reason spinoffs were made with these characters. But speaking of spinoffs, the side content in these games are second to none. I honestly spent just as much time hanging around in the hub areas looking at the concept art, stories, and mini games as I did running around catching monkeys. It also probably didn't help that Ape Skate 2 had a gacha element to it that keeps you coming back for more. Thankfully 3 just put in a shop so I can skip the gambling part. I can't help but wonder how much time was spent working on the side content because there's a lot of stuff between these three games. There are stories in 2 that are monkified versions of classic fables, uh, mostly Japanese fables. AKA Kid Me had no idea they were references. It was fine though because the stories hold up on their own. I mean I can admit that I laughed a little at some of the stories. Off the top of my head, Monkarella had an absurd ending that caught me off guard. 3 had the Simeon Cinema where a bunch of monkeys got to dress up and go wild, and that goes about the way you would expect. But all this pales to the mini games that are featured. The best way I can describe most of them are the essence of a larger game condensed into a mini game. The mini games also subscribe to the idea of using the analog sticks for unorthodox things but in a way that makes sense. Like the sticks controlling each fist of the monkey or each stick controlling an individual ski. And they are high quality mini games that have a lot of replayability. Ski Kids has you coming back so you can actually get good at pizza, french fry, and monkey soccer. It's just great. Of course, there's the one that everyone knows, Metal Gear Solid. There's honestly not much I can say about it because all you need to do is watch a video of it or look at what I have on the screen to truly understand why it's so well known. The mini games are a microcosm of what the series is as a whole. Great gameplay with unique, if not a little weird, controls, nonsensical stories, fun settings and cool visuals, humor that stems a lot from the monkeys, and of course, great music. 
And with that, we've made it to the end of the video. If you made it all the way here, thank you from the bottom of my heart for letting me drone on and on about this series I love. And even still, I'm not entirely sure I explain clearly why I love it so much. I know these games are not for everyone, just ask my friends who I shield to endlessly and still never played it. It's cool, as long as there's someone that sees this video and either shares in this journey down memory lane or decides to try it out for the first time. Be sure to leave in the comments below what your favorite game in the series is. Shoot, let me know what your favorite series of all time is, I'd love to see what you guys like. And if you like this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell because it really does help out a lot. But before you go pray this Apescate announcement is anything other than a pachinko machine, have a good day.